call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Joel Christian Gill, who's Associate Dean of Student Affairs at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. But more importantly, he is the author of several graphic novels, Strange Fruit, Volume 1, Uncelebrated Narratives from Black History, Words and Pictures by Joel Christian Gill, and also most recently, Bass Reeves, Takes on of the Talented Tenth, Volume 1, both of which were published by Fulcrum Books. How are you doing today, Joel? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm great. I, I absolutely love this series. Um, and, and, and our friend Skip Gates loves this series also. And, and, and he says of the books, by the time I finished reading Strange Fruit 1, I thought I'd let the comic book sellers have their mythic superheroes. Through Joel Tristan Gill, we now have our own. So this idea that, you know, we no longer have to look at uh, the comic book companies and try to do our own superheroes in blackface, you know, not that we don't love the Black Panther, but that we actually have an archive of, of black folks who were achievers that in which you've been able to take these stories and turn them into really stories of resistance. Talk a little bit how you got interested in, in both of these projects. Well, um, I started out drawing comics when I was, um, like, I draw just like everybody else did. If you're a kid and you have a pencil in your hand, you draw comics. And then it, something happens at about 12 or 13 years old where most people discover girls. I discovered that my hand didn't look like a circle with five sticks coming out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I started drawing more, um, drawing more from life and trying to figure things out. And I originally went to college because I wanted to draw comics and fell in love with painting for a long time. And I had a friend who um, looked at some series of paintings that I did called Strange Fruit that were based on lynching paintings and said to me, um, these paintings look a lot like you're trying to tell stories and you're failing at it. And what it made me do was go back and look at the way, you know, the, the idea of telling stories through a visual narrative and using comics as a, as a medium and when I originally started, I was trying to do my own autobiographical stories, which was a failure as well. And so I started finding stories about, I actually found a cartoonist named Box Brown. And when I looked him up, I found, I Googled him, I was cyber stalking him. <laughs> I found that he had, he had the same name as a slave name, right. named um, Box Brown. Right. And so I sent him a message. I said, why are you named after the slave? He was like, well, I think it's because I'm square shaped. That's why, that's why people call me box. But um, I think I might do a comic about that guy. And I'm like, this is my opportunity. I'm going to steal your idea. <laughs> Run with it. And so I started drawing the stories. And then people started giving me more stories. I would go to a, an event and people would read the story of Box Brown. And they would say, have you heard of the story of Major Taylor? And I'd say no. And so I'd pull out my little book and I'd write it down and I would go and I would start um, researching that new story and I'd have another story until eventually I had like a long list of them. And I started to look for um, a publisher and I noticed that there were no books of this nature out there. So I figured this would be a unique niche and that somebody would be interested in it. And Fulcrum was the first person, the first group to come to me because I had a lot of other publishers who were like, I want to see a finished book. And Fulcrum was like, no, we want it now. And so they, they bought the book before I was able to finish. And, um, and then they, they, they loved my book. So they, they spent a lot of time putting it out there, but you know, it just, it came, it's sort of, it's a really organic thing. I don't think any of the stories in strange fruit, uh, except for box Brown, came prompted from me. People would tell me the stories and then I would go out and I would draw them and research them. So it's almost as if you crowdsourced it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> True Volume 1 is, is definitely crowdsourced. I mean, there are a lot of the stories um, came from comic conventions, people saying, oh, have you heard about the story of Malaga Island? Or have you heard about, you know, people would come and tell me about it. And so then I would just make, then I would write them down and I would go and do the, do the work. And with the help of the librarians here at NHIA, they were fantastic. And they would help me with all the research. And it just, they just started rolling out. I mean, now I've got so many now that it's like, I don't even know when it's going to end. So think about this from the standpoint of, say, African-American studies and, and, and African-American history. You know, graphic novels have a certain kind of reputation 
that's aligned to certain kinds of audiences. You know, how do black audiences respond when, you know, when you present them with these wonderful graphic novels directly taken from African American history? One of the strangest things that's happened since I started drawing the books is that when you, when you do art, when you make art, people have a tendency to say, um, I really like what you've done. Or, you draw really well. Or, I like the way you do this. <laughs> and what people have been saying to me as they've read Strange Fruit or Tales of the Talented Tenth is thank you. Thank you for doing this yeah. to us, which actually prompted me to move, you know, at first, I was talking, you know, when I talked to people about my books, I would say things like, this is a really good teaching tool. And then it actually started to move me in a direction of saying, you know what, this is actually important on a, on a grander scale. We should be talking about this kind of history all the time. And which leads me to, you've probably seen it on my Twitter feed, 28 days are not enough. Like this right. idea that right. we should be talking about black history longer than just the 28 days or that, you know, 28 days are not enough and neither is 29. So, you know, like going through the idea of saying we should be talking about this all the time. The reason that these stories are uncelebrated and unheard of is because our history has been so segregated and we don't have enough time to spend talking about, you know, Paul Cuff, who was the richest black man during slavery, who, you know, built this empire and was going to bring all these people back. We don't have time to talk about him. You know, because we spend a lot of time talking about, in a lot of ways, just the greatest hit. So I want to expand that idea and make black history, for me and to everybody that I give my books to, as a broader understanding about what American history is. You know, it's interesting. We, we had on uh, Daryl Scott a few weeks ago, and, and Daryl Scott is the current president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Of course, the, the great organization that Carter G. Woodson founded, responsible for Negro History Week, Black History Month. And, and he made an interesting you know, observation that really the only time we talk about history in this country, regardless of whether we're talking about black history, but just American history, the only time that there's a really sustained focus on American history in this country is actually during February and during Black History Month. So, you know, so there's a way in which the work that you've done is not only telling these uncelebrated narratives within African American experience, but it's really foundationally you know, American history. Yeah, and I think what I think what we have a tendency to do in America is focus on the things that the 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 perfect the perfection of everything. You know, we don't want to talk about history because there's a lot of stuff in our history specifically that's not pleasant and not yeah. pure. You Christine, know, it's like, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, like one of the best examples of this is when I watched um, Twelve Years a Slave, which I thought was a fantastic movie. But I don't. When I read the book. I, the thing that I learned when I read the book was that the overseer in the book was the person who was going to protect the slaves. His job was right. to protect the slaves. Right. It was a completely different understanding. But when we do, when we do it in the movie, we make it. We have to do it black and white. The overseer is just another one of those people. Right. And I think sometimes we have this whole we have this, and I don't mean the pun, but black and white sort of understanding where there's a lot of gray in there. Yeah. And I think when and it's in the gray that people tend to beat us beat you know, historians and people, you know, well, this can't be true because it was like this, or that can't be true because it was like that. And I think you're right. Like a lot of times I don't think we do spend enough time talking about history on a regular basis. You know, and I advocate, um, I advocate for like, let's, let's stop talking about just black history during black history month. Let's talk about what, what we do and what unites us, right? Like the idea that there are riots, there are people who go out and protest things. And that protest started from the, from the Watts riots to the Stonewall riots to the riots at the Tea Party. You know, Tea Party rallies are just as much of a protest as anything else. Mm -hmm. While I don't agree with that stuff, it's just as American as anything else. And it would be better to spend our time talking about the things that unite us right. and the ideas that unite us than, than to sort of segregate our history. Because what it does is it tells people, oh, we're only going to, we're only going to invite Joel or Professor Neal to come and speak at our school during Black History Month because that's <laughs> what they do. You know what I mean? I don't know about you, but I would accept money at any time of the year. Yeah. <laughs> speak in April, I'll come and speak in April. You want me to come and speak in May? Especially if you're in the South and I live in New Hampshire, I would love to come someplace else in May to speak. Because I mean, that's you know, that's the thing. Let's not, let's not, let's not get into a place where we pigeonhole our own history in that one 28-day period. Let's expand that. Yeah. You know, when those Kent State students went to fight for um, expand. History Week to an entire month, it felt like it was, um, you know, a, a victory. But in reality, we need to expand it to 
12 months now. Let's talk about it all the time. And so that's what my books are seeking to do is to talk about history all the time. You know, I want kids to look at the, tale, the story of Bass Reeves and I want them to see somebody they can look up to, not just a black marshal, but like somebody who was amazing. You know, not, you know, any individual in the book, I want people to look at those people and see them. That's one of the reasons why I try to stay away from first in my book, because first tends to think, well, that's only important because you were a black person. But I want to do stories that are much more interesting. You know, the story of Box Brown is much more interesting than just the first. You know, the story of Henry Potter, Richard Potter, who was the first American stage magician, not first black stage magician. But American, right. The first American stage magician. And that's a really interesting story. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever been to New Hampshire. Well, when I leave the state, I significantly decrease the black population. <laughs> uh, just by leaving the state. So when you look at Richard Potter, who was active during the early seven, the late 1700s, early 1800s, he was a black man wandering around the, running around the eastern coast of the United States performing magic. magic. Those are really <laughs> interesting American stories, not necessarily just black stories. Absolutely. We're joined here today by Joel Christian Gill, who's the author of the book Strange Fruit, Volume 1, Uncelebrated Narratives from Black History, Words and Pictures by Joel Christian Gill, and also Bass Reeves, Tales of the Talented Tent, Volume 1, both of which are published by Fulcrum Books. You know, one of the things you just mentioned um, about celebrating Black History Month, not just the 28 days, but year round, and, and that's when it gets to this kind of issue around curriculum, because one of the ways that, you know, we can have a, a real direct impact on this kind of every day is, is American History Days is to make sure that some of these things are represented in our classrooms. One of the things I loved about your book, because in some ways it does on a text level, you know, something that you could hold on to, the same kind of work that we're starting to see in the digital realm, right? So everyone is doing like these digital shorts that, you know, take these tremendous historical moments and put them in like bite-sized three or four minute videos. You're, you're essentially doing the same thing along those lines, you know, with graphic novels. I had to fight with my 12-year-old daughter last night to be able to get your book out the house. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was like, where are you going with my book, <laughs> right? Because as soon as I brought it in and showed it to her, it's like she, she just loved it. It was a way for her to dig into the history, but visually appealing that kept her engaged, much the same way if, if she was watching something on her iPhone. Talk about how important it was to do this project and particularly pitching it to folks who are that kind of 12 to 18 range to give them some real heft around black history, but in a visual way that's attractive to them. You know, one of the things that are, that's interesting about the medium of comics is that you can tell stories in ways that you have never told them before. Yeah. Um, and with um, Tales of the Talented Tent and, and um, Strange Fruit, it's a way to, it, it engages people. It also, you can also do some things that you can't necessarily do in written language, which is explore the understanding about how we, the words that we use. And that's why I use those racist caricatures in the work. And that's why I try to use, you know, pictures, because pictures can be powerful. There are images that you can put out there that you can leave that out there for kids to talk about. It's like, why is it like this? You know, explain to me why this, this you know, the personification of racism is this one person who is Jim Crow in the book. And he's chasing after Bass Reeves. And he's like, no matter what Bass Reeves does, he's always there in the background. And the same thing happens with Major Taylor or any of the other characters. So there's a way in which you tell stories visually that I think, you know, frankly, I think in America we're behind because as we've seen in the last couple of weeks in the, the French and Europe, they already understand how important comics are as a medium and has a way to tell stories. And I think, you know, there's a whole history. We could talk a whole nother thing about how, why comics aren't as important in the United States. But I think they're now starting to be seen in a light that's a little different than just funny stories for kids. And I try to write stories, not necessarily, and people, you, people ask me, it's like, did you write these for kids? How did you write them? I was like, I was writing these for hipsters. That was my goal. Like, <laughs> people, people who find, who want interesting things. Is, and that's the idea. And then when, when Fulcrum was like, this will be a great market for kids fourth through, um, through high school. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Because I had never thought of it. I was just looking for interesting stories. And that's, that's sort of the way I think about it, is to try to find interesting stories that I could put out there that nobody's ever heard before. Because I'll be honest with you, you know, I, have no, I had no idea who the, the, the Ophelis, the Ophelis Thompson was <laughs> until, the I, until I opened this, right? And, and so, yeah, it does this extra labor, particularly, you know, in a moment where, 
you know, as adults, you know, folks don't have the time to sit down and read a 550 page historical narrative. And, right. and, and, and this at least opens up a space for them to develop a certain kind of curiosity about stories about people that, you know, they then at least can be more intentional, you know, in their ability to find out more about some of these stories. Yeah. And I think, you know, Theophilius Thompson, which has he has a fantastic name, <laughs> um, you know, like the idea that you can spend, you know, you can go through all of Strange Fruit in about two or three hours. Like it's not a long read. It's not like a dense thing, but there's a lot of history in there. You know, you've yeah, got the history right. of the Old West. You know, one of the things that I tried to portray in the Old West is that most of the people in the Old West were people of color. Oh, they were right. not white, like right. the like the lily white, you know, sort of visions of it that we get on television. It's, it's not Bonanza. Um, <laughs> it's not Bonanza, right? Um, or, you know, like the idea of like how people got from place to place. You know, I, there's a lot of things you can put out there that people can take a look at and see. And I think it, you know, it's, you know, there's a lot of history. And I, you know, one of the things that's difficult about drawing comics is like if you read a story about Thomas Jefferson, you never have to think about what kind of pants he's wearing. Like Thomas Jefferson, what, kind, what does his shoes look like? What's he holding in his hand? What's the furniture look like? And so you have to at least, you don't have to be a slave to that stuff, but you also have to make sure that you're adding those things in a way that people can actually see them and get a feel for what was going on around them. So you have to be historically accurate in some places as well. So it gives you a lot of information that you don't have to spell out. I love this quote that you have in the, in the opening page. Uh, for all those, you dedicate the book for all those who freed themselves by cutting the rope. Elaborate a little bit around that phrase. You know, the original Strange Fruit was a series of paintings that I did based on Billie Holiday's song, Strange Fruit. And the, the most successful painting in that group was a self-portrait. And it was, I had a noose around my neck and I had cut the, it was, a, I was holding a frayed noose. And what I was trying to say with the metaphor of this painting was, we've come a long way because I was able to cut that rope, but that rope is still there. That's, that rope is still embedded in a lot of institutions across the country and a lot of ways we think about racism. So what I was trying to say in that is that, you know, there's, there are people who have before me, long before I did, you know, freed themselves by cutting the rope. Major Taylor freed himself by cutting that rope, by becoming successful. Um, and Richard Potter freed himself by cutting that rope. So there were a lot of people, and some people who are not in this book will be in the next book, who freed themselves by cutting the rope. And so what I was thinking about is the rope is that metaphor. It's that thing that we still don't talk about sometimes. You know, like that, you know, I always say, because I, I was born in Virginia and I, I lived in Virginia, and I still consider myself a Southerner. <laughs> and I think that being a Southerner, you know, it's like, being in, if you're black and you're in love with South, if you're in love with the South, it's like falling in love with the prostitute. There's just some things you just don't talk about, and I think um, that's one. That's exactly one of those things that I think, you know, you have to understand is that there is that that built up history. You know, no matter what we do, as professors, as professionals, we we look in the mirror and we are seen as a black man first. Not necessarily a professor or associate dean or a cartoonist or a graphic novelist. It's like you are a black something else. And whether you use that or whether you're offended by it or whatever the case may be, doesn't really matter. But it's that rope. That's the rope, right? That's the thing that ho that's hanging over us. And that we work, we, we survive in spite of that. I mean, President Obama still has that, right? He still has that rope around his neck. Because sometimes, it doesn't matter what he does, you know, he'll fist bump somebody and all of a sudden it's a terrorist fist jab. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you know, it's that understanding that we have that rope that we're always carrying around. And there's some people who cut that rope and freed themselves. And they did it in much stronger circumstances than me. We've been joined today by Professor Joe Christian Gill. You know, both of the books, uh, Strange Fruit and also Bass Reeves' Tales of the Talented Tenth, are, are titled Volume One. Uh, so I, I guess that means there will be more to come. So when can we expect to see more of these wonderful books? So um, I'm working on a story right now of Bessie Stringfield, who was known as the Negro Motorcycle Queen. She was a small little woman who um, by the time she was in her early 20s, in the early 30s and 40s, had crisscrossed the United States on a motorcycle by herself. 
and um, she ran. She was a motorcycle courier for the U.S. military. Um, she was the first black woman inducted into the American uh, Motorcycle Association Hall of Fame. She's in the Harley Davidson Hall of Fame. You know, she was just, I mean, for lack of a better word, she was a badass. I mean, like <laughs> in the South in the 30s and 40s, she was riding this motorcycle. She would do these things called penny tours. She would lay a map out. She would throw a penny at it. And wherever the penny lands, she would go there. And so I'm working on her story now. After that, I'll, and that'll be out in May of 2016, I think. I think that's what Fulcrum told me. If I'm wrong, <laughs> Melanie, I'm sorry, Beck. I didn't mean to get the things wrong. Um, and, um, you know, and then the next one is um, Strange Fruit Volume 2, which will have, um, I'm going to do a story about Mayor Baynard in there. I'm going to do a story about Blind Tom Wiggins. I'm going to do the story of um, Cathay Williams, who was the only known female Buffalo soldier. Um, um, Jim, James Beckworth, Mountain Man, Teller of Tall Tales. Um, I got lots of stories. I mean, I got a whole list of them. It's, it's kind of crazy, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. We've been joined today by Joel Christian Gill, who's Associate Dean of the Student Affairs at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. He's also, also the author of the graphic novel Strange Fruit, Volume 1, Uncelebrated Narratives from Black History, and most recently, Bass Reeves, Tales of the Talented 10th, Volume 1, both published by Fulcrum Books. Thanks for joining us today, Joel. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really had a fun time talking to you about it. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back, black.